Moments with Mary Ann. I'm so delighted we're spending this time here today. We have a very empowering show coming right up with special guest, Welcome Wilson. And he's here today to share with us his new book, Always Welcome, Nine Decades of Great Friends, Great Times, and Mostly Great Deals. Now, Welcome is the chairman of the board of the Welcome Group, LLC, which as a landlord owns 87 manufacturing and other industrial facilities in Texas, comprising just less than 4 million square feet of space. He has been a real estate developer in Texas for 61 years and recently was inducted into the Texas Business Hall of Fame. In the last few years, he's also received the Trailblazer Award from the American Advertising Federation of Houston, the Crusaders Award from Houston Neighborhood Centers, the Entrepreneur of the Year Award from the Houston Technology Center, the Distinguished Service Award from Cornet Global, and the Lifetime Achievement Award from the Houston Business Journal. He currently serves on the board of directors for the Greater Houston Partnership, where he was a longtime chairman of its higher education community. So it's my honor to introduce Welcome Wilson. Thank you. Thank you, Marianne. What a pleasure and honor it is to have you here. My goodness, your book. It is a great read. I really enjoyed reading it. Thank you very much. Well, and so I have to ask you, I mean, I think most people are curious, you know, was such a fabulous name, how did you get your name? <clears throat> well, I'll tell you, Mary Ann, if you're interested. Uh, oh, yeah. The uh, doctor told my parents that I would be a girl, so they had a girl's name picked out, lost in memory. And uh, then I surprised them and everybody by being a 12-pound boy. Oh, wow. So I was born at home, which was the custom 91 years ago. Mm -hmm. And uh, so there's no hospital to make you name the baby. So the doctor folded his bag and left, and uh, they started discussing what to name the boy, and uh, three days later, they were arguing about what to name the boy, and then a week went by, they're still arguing, two weeks went by, three weeks went by, 22 days after I was born, my father arrived home from work. And said, why don't we name him Welcome so he'll know he's welcome, though he's not a girl. And that's what they did. What a fabulous story, my goodness. And what a great name. I mean, you've got to be so proud of your name. I have no complaints about the name. The thing about it is, (laughs) it's easy to remember. Let me uh, mention something. Mm -hmm. When I registered in the public schools... Actually, it was in kindergarten. It was in private school. <clears throat> the kindergarten teacher told my mother, erroneously, that we can't possibly call him welcome because the other kids will make fun of him. Well, nobody makes fun of welcome, and welcome junior had no problem. Welcome the third had no problem. The point is, to a kindergartner, Every name is new. Garland, for heaven's sakes. <clears throat> Every name is different and new. So they don't know what uh, is weird or not. <clears throat> so uh, I should have been registered as welcome, but instead my mother registered me by my middle name, which is Wade, W-A-D-E. So in now, mm-hmm. so in high school, when I was getting ready for, to uh, go in the in the service in the army, I thought during World War Two, <clears throat> I 
I went to the bank, the local bank in Brownsville, Texas, to buy a war bond. And with, when you buy a war bond, no exceptions, it's first name, middle initial, last name. No exceptions. So I submitted uh, my, 25, my $18.50 for a $25 war bond and uh, submitted the name Welcome W. Wilson. So the clerk behind the desk said, behind the counter, said, Welcome, wow. Boy, nobody could ever forget that name. So I, I thought to myself, well, maybe I'm missing something here. So when I transferred from Brownsville Junior College, from which I graduated, <clears throat> to the University of Houston in the city of Houston, I registered as Welcome W. Wilson, and I've been Welcome W. Wilson ever since. Well, it is, it, I mean, she is 100% right, it is a name that no one will forget. And for very good reason. I mean, you had an impact not only within the Houston and Texas area, but, you know, across the country. And, you know, before I get too far ahead, I would love for you to share, because, my goodness, you've had many paths, but I'd love for you to share what started you in business. Well, I, my first job was when I graduated in 1949, was as assistant director of nursing in the School of Nursing at the University of Houston. And my job was recruiting nurses, which was hard to do. They all came from small towns, by the way, in those days. <clears throat> and, uh, and raising money for scholarships which all came from one source, the Houston Endowment. Jesse Jones, who is a Houstonian, created the largest endowment in Texas. And he didn't name it after himself, the Jones Foundation. He named it the Houston Endowment. And that's the kind of guy he was. But the point is, he had married one time to a nurse, and uh, <clears throat> so the foundation, the foundation, the endowment, was very, very favorable to nursing. So I got a lot of money for nurses' scholarships from the Houston Endowment. Mm -hmm. But uh, I'd, I'd always wanted to go into business. Uh, my father always assumed I would be in, in business. And my father always told me that to succeed in business, it takes guts and determination. Now, he didn't mean guts to get into a fight. He meant the guts to go make a pitch that's highly in your favor to somebody you've never met before in your life. So I learned that characteristic. And uh, it, served, it served me well over the time. But uh, after uh, about six months, or the eight months, in this job as assistant director of the College of Nursing, I was <clears throat> called into the service in the Navy, in Naval Reserve, during the Korean War. I missed World War II by two weeks because I had orders to report for the draft uh, in 1945 on September 17th. And uh, the month before, Harry Truman dropped two atom bombs on Japan and the war ended in a week. So I miss World War II, <clears throat> barely. But uh, the Korean War got me, and I served two years as a naval officer in Japan. And when I returned, I went back to work for the University of Houston in a new job, 
as Assistant Director of Public Relations. And about five months later, uh, I got the opportunity to go to work for an oil man in Houston. R.E. Bob Smith was his name. And he was absolutely the, the biggest friend I ever had. He was 65 and I was 25. But we were best friends. Uh, every day at 1 o'clock, we would go to the health club and work out. And in, in, let me assure you that in 1952, few people did that. 1952 and 53. And I've been at it ever since. Now 55 years later, I'm still going to the health club every morning, including this morning. So I was going to be, become an oil man, and uh, which Houston was full of oil men in those days, still is. And uh, but the day I was to report to work for Ari e. Bob Smith, the mayor of Houston appointed him the dollar a year. Director of Civil Defense. So when I reported in to Bob Smith, I said, well, I see now what you want me to do. You want me to go to City Hall and run the Civil Defense Department. And he said, well, I didn't have that in mind, but that's a good idea. So he sent me <laughs> to City Hall, where I became a department head, and a later an assistant to the mayor. And uh, so my business career was interrupted by government service. <clears throat> so I served there for three years. And then uh, I was appointed to the executive office of the president by Dwight Eisenhower when he was president. And the, and the reason I was appointed, I was 27 years old. The reason I was appointed to such a high position was not because of any great qualifications or great achievement on my part. It was simply because Eisenhower had been trying to get Bob Smith to take the job because he held the job in World War II. This is five state director of defense mobilization. And, uh, which was a branch of the executive office of the president. And, uh, and so finally Bob Smith told Eisenhower, I'm too old, appoint welcome. So he did. So now I'm, there I was, by the age 30, I had the civil service rank of a three star general. It's part of the executive office of the president. I even got the uh, Arthur Fleming Award for my service because a small branch of what we did <clears throat> is now called FEMA, Natural Disaster Agency. And so I got a, in 1958, I got the Arthur Fleming Award for my work in the uh, Natural Disasters in Louisiana, which was one of my five states. And then after five years, <clears throat> I went to my wife and I said, you know, this government service is, uh, is very rewarding. And I liked it because when I flew to New Orleans, for example, to make a speech, my picture would be on the front page of the Times Picky. So I got a lot of attention wherever I went. And, uh, <clears throat> and the salary was good and, uh, because I had the rank of a three-star general. So I told her that, you know, this government service is 
pretty good, and uh, and maybe I ought to just make a career of it, because by that time I had civil service standing, meaning they can't fire you except for unless you mess up. Mm-hmm. So she said, she said, uh, listen, I didn't marry you to be the wife of a federal employee. She said, I want my kids to go to private schools. I want to be a socialite in Houston. I want to live on River Oaks Boulevard. That's the premier street in Houston in River Oaks section. And, uh, and none of that's going to happen if I'm a, the wife of a federal employee. So that was a life-changing conversation, one of many life-changing conversations, not (laughs) many, but five or six Mm -hmm. that I had during my career. So I resigned my position and uh, went back to Houston to uh, go into become a real estate developer. And the reason I became a real estate developer was kind of by accident because Along the way, Bob Smith said, look, welcome, the oil business is over for the independent. He was wrong, but Mm -hmm. he said these wells are costing $30,000 or $40,000 each to drill, and the independent just can't raise that kind of money. Well, he didn't know about master limited partnerships and the other things that T. Boone Pickens and others in America organized to uh, become billionaires by being in the oil business. But eh. but anyway, he, he was the largest landowner in Harris County, Texas, which is Houston. And uh, he owned thousands of acres of land. And... Uh, eh. And some of it extremely valuable land. For example, in Houston, he owned both sides of what later became the West Loop, which is the freeway, circles of Houston about five miles out. Then he became the owner of both sides of the West Belt, further out, 15 miles out, another freeway. So he he was he had faith in real estate. So he told me that I should become a real estate investor, and uh, so I kept looking for opportunities, and I I got the, my first opportunity when a piece of land in Galveston County <clears throat> became available on the beach in Galveston, and I started a subdivision. Jamaica Beach, it was called. So that's how I got into business. I've been a real estate dev. That was 62 years ago, and I'm still at, I'm still trying to get it right. <laughs> well, I think you got some things right there because it's it's interesting just the way that your life's path has taken, and I love the input from you know your wife where she. You know, she really knew what she wanted, you know? Yes. Uh, Speaking of life-changing conversations, my first was with the dean of Brownsville Junior College. He was brand new to the job, and I had finished my freshman year at junior college, And when my orders to report for the draft got canceled, I signed up for a second year at Brownsville Junior College. So after about a month, he called me in to his office, the dean of Brownsville Junior College. His name was Neil M. Nelson. And he said, welcome. I don't think you recognize it, but you're a natural leader, and I don't think you even know it. And he said, uh, 
he said that you need to be thinking in terms of the fact that you are a leader and that you need to take control of every situation you're involved in. So two weeks later, I was elected president of the student body of Brownsville Junior College. I was elected president of two clubs out of three. The only club I wasn't president of was the Phi Beta Kappa Club, and I wasn't even a member of that one. (laughs) Uh, Because uh, good grades have never been my strong suit because I I always worked full time. My father believed that a man ought to work full time and support himself from the time he's 14 years old. So when I was 14, I went to work for my father. He owned a radio station in Brownsville, Texas. And by the time I was 15, I was a senior in high school and I was a disc jockey on the radio, and I was a newscaster on the radio, and uh, it was during World War II, and uh, <clears throat> and anybody that was 17 and a half was gone in the service. Mm-hmm. So all the jobs were held by teenagers like me. Well, I can tell you've got that that voice for radio, you know. So <laughs> your your father chose well having you there, you know, doing that. Gosh, yeah, I've got more questions obviously than we have time. What I would love for you to share with us about is that you know you had a huge part in changing just the dynamics in regards to the civil rights movement in Houston. And I would love for you to share some of that with our listeners. Okay. The, uh, my first experience was I got a call from the mayor who was a friend of mine. His name was Louis Coutre in the early sixties. And he was mayor of Houston and I was his go-to guy. Some people would call it his bag man. But uh, I called it the go-to guy, meaning that whatever came along, uh, he put me in charge of it because he had confidence in me. For example, when when John F. Kennedy came to Houston to announce the Manned Spacecraft Center in Houston, the mayor put me in charge of the event. Uh, When the JFK came back, uh, the day before he was assassinated in Houston, uh, the mayor put me a, in charge of the arrival at the airport and the motorcade downtown. And I had I, got a bunch of anecdotes about that, but yeah. but I was the mayor's go-to guy. So he called me and he said, welcome, we've got to do something about this sit-in in in lunch counters in downtown Houston. He said, I I don't want to happen to Houston what has happened already in Atlanta, New Orleans, Little Rock, and other places in the South. And the point is, in those cities, uh, black people, African Americans, would go sit at a lunch counter and not be served and it would cause a riot. And uh, and they appropriately wanted to be able to sit and uh, go to a lunch counter like anybody else. But in those days, it was against the law in every city in the South. So the mayor says, welcome you, we've got to, it started in Houston and we've got to do, we've got to get it organized and avoid what's happened elsewhere. So I went to the mayor's office and, uh, and then went over and witnessed a couple of uh, sit-ins 
what was happening was that at a university in Houston that's now called Texas Southern University, mm-hmm. at the time was called Texas State College for Negroes. And uh, some well-dressed students would catch the bus downtown from the campus and go to a lunch counter at a, and we had eight lunch counters downtown, and they would rotate, and they'd go to a lunch counter and sit there and wait to have the order taken, which was never taken. So they'd sit there about an hour with uh, photographers around and so forth, and then they'd catch the bus and go back to the university. So, uh, <clears throat> so I called a meeting of the eight owners of lunch counters in downtown Houston. There were eight. <clears throat> and they came over to the mayor's office. And uh, I said, we're not going to make the mistake that Atlanta and other places have made because in Houston, business businesses come together to solve problems before they get out of hand. And that's what we're going to do. So at first, nobody could agree to anything. And then <clears throat> the Foley Brothers was the largest department store in Texas located in Houston, and they had a lunch counter, a prominent lunch counter, (coughs) that had been visited uh, two or three times by the students. So Bob Dundas, who was vice president for marketing, (coughs) was at the meeting, and uh, he, he kind of took the lead And said, look, if we all desegregate together at the same moment, we can get through this. If we can control the publicity. So after another two hours, everybody agreed to desegregate. But we all agreed that we had to have a low publicity profile on the event. So I called the three daily newspapers in Houston, the Chronicle, the the Post, and the Press, and talked to all of them. The Press and the Chronicle immediately said they wouldn't run any any story. The Post said, we'll run a story, but we'll put it way back, and it'll be a one-column story and uh, no headlines. Then I called the one TV station we had at the time, and they agreed to cooperate. By the way, in today's climate, uh, I could never have made this work. Mm-hmm. But in but in those days, everybody, the, the Post, for example, agreed to run a story, but a very small story, way back in the paper. So uh, I called the group at, at uh, Texas Southern University and asked them to come down and and have enough students to sit at eight, all eight lunch counters. So they agreed immediately. And uh, <clears throat> so the next Monday at uh, 12 noon, The lunch counters were desegregated and the people were served. And let me mention one other thing about LBJ. Lyndon Johnson was a good friend of mine, had been a long time because he was a senator from Texas before he was president of the United States, and he was a majority leader uh, in the Senate before he became president. So I got a telephone call from Jack Valenti in the spring of 1963. 
That date is very important. <clears throat> Spring of 1963. And he said that Jack Blenty was a uh, head, a friend of mine. In fact, that he was a partner in Jamaica Beach in Galveston. He was an advertising agency guy that had handled the campaign for Kennedy and Johnson uh, in 1960. In 1963, LBJ was vice president of the United States. So, <clears throat> Blenny had married Mary Margaret Wiley, who had been LBJ's secretary. We called them secretaries in those days. We we don't don't now we call them assistants. But uh, <clears throat> anyway, he had married uh, somebody that was a favorite of LBJ's. So Blaney called me one day and he said, look, the LBJ is coming to town this weekend and he wants me to round up the guys on Sunday for a reception here at my house. The guys were all the original partners of Jamaica Beach, Johnny Goen, who is Later, Mayor Pro Tem of Houston for 22 years. Uh, Bill Sherrill, later a uh, a member of the Federal Reserve Board in uh, Washington D.C. Uh, Jack Blenny, myself, and my brother Jack, later a Pentagon official. So. Uh, <clears throat> So I immediately agreed that my wife and I would be over there at 3 o'clock on uh, Sunday. Uh, Blenny lives on St. Philippi Street, which was about six blocks from my house on River Oaks Boulevard. By the way, uh, <clears throat> my kids ended up going, going to private school, Kincaid School in Houston, uh, I have five kids. They all graduated from Kincaid. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> my wife became a socialite, and I and I bought a house on River Oaks Boulevard. So my wife's dreams were fulfilled. But anyway, back to Blenny. <clears throat> I said we'd be there at 3 o'clock, so... My wife and I drove over there. We were about 15 minutes late, and everybody else had already arrived. So I went in and got a glass of wine, and I noticed that LBJ, the vice president, was sitting over next to the fireplace in an overstuffed chair. So I went over and sat in the overstuffed chair next to him, and I said, Mr. Vice President, and by the way, Marianne, you know how it is when you're with somebody important, you try to think of something important to talk about, as opposed to just, you know, the weather. So I said, Mr. Vice President, the uh, JFK has introduced the civil rights legislation in Congress, but it seems to be dead on arrival. And let me tell you, Barry Ann, why it was dead on arrival. In the East Coast and the Midwest and in California, they would throw their congressmen and senators out after four to six years. In the South, including Texas, we elected them for life. So the chairman of every important committee in Congress, Senate and House, was from the South, including the chairman of the Judiciary Committee, who was from Georgia. So the reason there was civil rights legislation was dead on arrival was because in the South they didn't believe in civil rights in those days. <clears throat> 
So I so I asked my question of LBJ, and I could tell he was trying to determine whether or not I was important enough to give a real answer to. And I must have passed the test, Marianne, because he put down his coffee, decaf coffee, and said, welcome, let me tell you a story. And he said, when we were campaigning for president and vice president, the vice president's entourage was traveling through New Mexico. And welcome, you know how New Mexico is. You drive for two hours and you see nothing but cactus. And then suddenly you come across a filling station. We call them filling stations in those days, by the way, not service stations. You come across a filling station on the side of the road. It's always two stories. The couple lives upstairs. The filling station is downstairs. And you pull in there and go to the bathroom. You get a Coke. You fill up with gas, and then you go on. So the, the vice president's entourage of about seven cars did that. <clears throat> and then after about 20 minutes, we were ready to leave, and we, there was one girl that we couldn't find. We looked everywhere in that service that filling station for the girl, but couldn't find her. So after about five minutes, she walked in the back door, and it turns out she had been a block behind the building, squatting down behind the bush to go to the bathroom because she was black, and they wouldn't let her use the restroom in the filling station. So he grabbed my knee with his left hand and he pointed his right finger in my face and he said, welcome, that's wrong. That is wrong. And Marianne, I'll never forget his next words, which were, and when I'm in a position to do something about it, I'm going to. That was the spring of 1963. Six months later, he's president of the United States. Six months after that, against all odds, he passes the Civil Rights Act of 1964. And then a year later, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. And then two years later, the <clears throat> Fair Housing Act of 19. 67. So anyway, so <laughs> the uh, I feel like I was a part of the civil rights movement. And, uh, and by the way, when I was mayor of Houston, uh, when I was assistant mayor of Houston, assistant to the mayor, <clears throat> the mayor would send me out to make speeches when he couldn't speak, when he was asked to speak. So uh, frequently it would be to a black church. We didn't call it black, we called it Negro church in those days, later blacks and later African Americans. But in my speech, at the mayor's direction, I would always say that we recognize the unfairness of certain things. For example, uh, a black person could not use a water fountain in a public space. They had separate water fountains for African Americans to use, and it just it made no sense. So I would say something to the effect that we recognize that the injustice exists and we're working on it and, and we're bringing it along as fast as we can. There was more <clears throat> an op a chance to mollify the situation as opposed to solve any problem. 
that's my story. Well, that's just a part of your story. I mean, my goodness, you have so many other things that you have talked about in your book, you've written about in your book, Always Welcome. I I highly suggest our listeners pick up their own copy of this book. What are some, what are the things that you want the listeners to take away from reading your book? Well, I'd like them, them to feel like that anybody can be become a success in business and life if they if they have perseverance. The uh, and I've seen it time and time again. Uh, you've got to have guts to make a pitch, and you have to have perseverance and determination to follow through and make it work. So that's, that's I would say, was my message in the book. Well, welcome. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show with us today. We so greatly appreciate it and really respect all the work that you've done, not just um, you know in business, but for our country as well. Thank you, Marianne. It's been such an honor to spend this time with you. Welcome. I'm so glad we got to talk about your new book, Always Welcome. Man, what a great read and what an inspiration you are. For our listeners that would like to learn more about Welcome Wilson, you can at his website, welcomegroup.com. And his book, Always Welcome, is available at Barnes & Noble, Amazon, and all indie bookstores. Well, we're at the end of our time today. I would like to thank everyone for tuning in. You're listening to Moments with Marianne. And remember, make every moment count. single moment, your life can change. Moments with Marianne is a transformative hour that covers an endless array of topics with the best of the best. Her guests are leaders in their fields, ranging from inspirational authors, top industry leaders, and business and spiritual entrepreneurs. Each guest is gifted and a true visionary, a recognized leader in her own work. And while teaching others to develop, refocus, and grow, Marianne will bring the best guest and sometimes a special surprise. Don't miss this. You never know just which moment will change your life forever. Moments with Mary Ann airs every Sunday, Monday, Thursday, and Friday at 8 p.m. Eastern and 5 p.m. Pacific Time. Make sure to tune in and visit momentswithmaryann.com for more information.